there, my Attachment Theory and Action podcast listeners and viewers. I'm your host, Jenna Kelly, and I am beyond excited to share this next interview with you. I sit down with Eli Harwood, who's kind of become a rock star in attachment world right now, and that's how I discovered her. She's known as the attachment nerd on social media, and so I think I finally met a bigger nerd than me, and she loves starting out, and she's really devoted her life and her career and her passion to the intricate art and science of attachment relationships, so she takes the research, and she makes it practical and relatable, and that's what you're going to hear throughout this interview. She has her master's in counseling psychology. She's a licensed therapist in Colorado. She has over 17 years of clinical experience in working with individuals, couples, and families. She's also a teacher, formerly served as a faculty member at the Denver Family Institute. And she also currently teaches at Attachment Lab. And she is the author, hot off the press, of this new beautiful book, Securely Attached, Transform Your Attachment Patterns into Loving, Lasting, Romantic Relationships. And this book is really an invitation for a lot of our own self-exploration and self-healing because it starts with us. And then when we're able to do that, then we can apply that to our other relationships, parenting, caregiving, and our work. So we're going to nerd out about her book and other things, um, just all kinds of wisdom and tips that she has for you. So I really just want you to enjoy this interview because she is a lot of fun and enjoy. Well, hello, Eli. Welcome to the Attachment Theory in Action podcast. I am super excited to be in conversation with you today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to it. Yes, me too. Just the name of our podcast, Attachment Theory in Action, I think really speaks your language and the work that you're doing, which is how I discovered you. So I discovered you on Instagram. You're known as Attachment Nerd. You kind of have this whole identity with that and (laughs) the work that you're doing. And you're putting out this really amazing, helpful content. And I think the reason why people are so sucked in, myself included, because you have like over a half a million followers, is because you do it in a way that makes it, A, you're using the research, so you're keeping it attachment science informed, but you're making it practical, Mm -hmm. you're making it funny, you're making it relatable, Mm -hmm. You also show your own vulnerability and share your own stories, which is so important when we talk about attachment. And, you know, you are, and you have really cool earrings. Like I told you, if nothing else, I have to tune in just to see what what earrings you're wearing every day. (laughs) That's so fun. But I love it. And so it's no surprise that it culminated in this beautiful book that I know we're going to be talking about today too, Securely Attached, Transform Your Attachment Patterns into Loving, Lasting, Romantic relationships. But before we get into that, I would love to invite more of your own attachment into our conversation because as you know, it's already there and you talk so beautifully about it already. So could you start us off, Eli, by sharing an attachment memory that comes up for you that feels important to you and to your work? Yes. So I'm going to start us a little bit deep because the truth of how I've come to this work is based in pretty insecure beginnings. Um, One of my earliest memories is being inside my home. And I know I was under five because we moved from this house when I was five. um, And not being able to find my mom in the house and looking around the house and feeling nervous and finding her downstairs in like, um, like a broom closet, like a furnace closet just curled up in a ball cry. Mm. By and the overwhelm in my nervous system that at that point I think was pretty familiar of like, my mom is not okay. How do I fix it? What do I do to help her feel better? How can I help? Um, I don't remember exactly what happened. My instinct is, is that she got, she was kind of surprised I found her. She was, she was hiding because she didn't want me to have to see how not okay she was. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And then I think she probably did her best kind of fake it till you make it vibes. Like, oh no, I was just looking for a broom and kind of picked me up. And years later, I shared that story with her and she burst into tears. And she said, I was just hoping you would forget, you were going to forget that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that legacy of insecurity was something she inherited from her parents, probably them from theirs. Who knows how far back it went? Um, But it led in my journey to a really deep sense of hypervigilance in my relationships. Um, My mom was struggling with mental illness, with PTSD, with unresolved insecure attachments from her family. Um, And so I as a child, didn't have anyone that I could really go to and feel like, ah, oh, that safe haven with, right? Um, which led to some therapy later on in my life, which led to more therapy, which led to graduate school, <laughs> which led to being a therapist for 17 years, which led to me feeling like I want everyone who was ever that little kid trying to find the safe haven and instead having to become the safe haven for their parents. I want all those people and everyone else too, anyone who had any secure experience to be able to learn secure healing and secure attachment patterns and to be able to give to their children what my mom didn't have the privilege of being able to give to me. Mm Mm-hmm. Is that longer than you usually get as a response? (laughs) You know, I get responses all over the place, but it's it's such a beautiful, important place to start the conversation because they said it's already in the conversation. So let's, let's name it. And it's no accident that we as therapists stumble into this field because we are often doing, helping others do their work, but also finishing some of our own business, which is never finished, which is why why we're in it because we're, we're always learning and growing and healing. And I think about that, that little five-year-old you finding your mom like that and how it much more became about taking care of her needs, even though she tried to protect you from that and wanted to do the best that she could with, with where she was at, but that it makes sense that you were insecure because you were then tending to her needs and not, you know, so who was, who was really meeting your needs. Well, and it was a pattern, right? Like the the pattern wasn't always the broom closet, but the pattern was my mom would was flooded with emotions and with mental illness and with a, a deep dysregulation. And I noticed. Mm-hmm. I could feel it. And it it affected how I brought myself into the room and how I related to other people. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so your book, Securely Attached, is really invites people to take their own journey of healing some of those attachment wounds, much like I know you have done for yourself and in the work that you're doing. And that's why it's this book is so important. It's such a gift. Um, so thank you. I want to hear more about it. The other thing that I thought you know, just from following you on, on Instagram and your social media content, you talk so much about parenting from your own perspective with your own children and helping other parents. And so I thought for sure your first book was going <laughs> to be on parenting. Huh. And so then when I got this copy and started reading it, it makes sense to me why you started with ourselves and healing and looking at the way that shows up in our own relationships, including romantic relationships. But I'd love to hear from you why this book and why did you start with, with this instead of parenting? Yes. So we know from the data, two things. One, children who have caregivers who are able to be deeply grounded, so emotionally settled, as a pattern, not emotionally numb, not robots, not we're not Stepford wives here, but like who can feel calm and confident who they are and who can be warm and responsive to a child's tenderness and needs. That is the core crux of how secure attachment um, gets cultivated, right? And it's this dance between disconnection and connection, but ultimately it is driven by a caregiver who has this capacity, okay? And the second thing we know is that If we have either 
been born into a family where there already are secure patterns, great, we inherit a secure attachment pattern, then we're likely to pass it on. Or if we didn't inherit an attachment pattern, the primary indicator that we will change that pattern, that we will break the cycle, is that we have gone back and reflected on our own childhoods, on our own experiences, grieved those experiences. So not just thought about them intellectually, like actually let ourselves release some snot, some boogers, some tears around what it is that we didn't have growing up. Then we have a much, much higher likelihood of passing on secure patterns to our children. So for me, it's a little bit of the cart and the horse. Mm -hmm. I want people to do their work to process their childhoods and their attachment patterns And then to learn how to create close adult relationships in their life, because that's how we intuitively learn how to give that to our kids. Mm -hmm. We learn to give empathy from having experienced empathy. We learn to be nurturing by having been given nurture that we can really sense how powerful it is and how it helps and how it redirects us and all that stuff. So if if I was to put out my parenting book first, my, my concern was people get really stuck on the tips and and scripts and tricks. And you can say all the right things. You can even do all the right things. But if your nervous system isn't well-regulated, if you have not processed your own attachment uh, experiences, your children are going to feel the energy and the material from those experiences instead of being connected to the intention you have in giving them a different experience. Mm -hmm. A lot of people unintentionally pass on insecurity, even though they're trying very hard not to because they haven't put in the healing work to really be secure in their own body and their own nervous system. Yes. And I really want our listeners and viewers to, if they don't, if I'm sure you're going to give us so many other good takeaways, but I think that's going to be the common thread, the biggest takeaway. Like you said, the research supports it too, that this is something that we have the power to heal and and to resolve. And when we do that, we show up in healthier ways and increase the chances that our children will then be able to securely attach to us. It's not a thing. It's not a tool. Yes, parenting books are great. um, But that can also help keep us, especially if maybe you have more of an avoidant dismissive style, like, let me just focus on the what (laughs) instead of the why and, and really being in with that. And so as soon as I got the book, it made so much sense. Like, yes, (laughs) I know this. Um, You just hear me talking about parenting so much. I mean, I talk about couples relationships as well, but I do talk more about parenting partially because I did my deep couples secure bonding years ago. My husband and I both worked through our attachment stuff together. Um, It's like a well-oiled machine at this point in my journey, but I'm in the midst of parenting. So I'm like thinking about the parenting side of things all the time because Mm -hmm. I've I've never had an eight-year-old until this last year, right? I've never had twin three and a half year olds until this last year. And so, and I've never had three kids all at once. So that's, Mm -hmm. I think that's why a lot of folks would be like, huh, I wonder why she did that. And it's because that's really how we get to the root of offering security to our children as we yeah. process our own insecure experiences. Mm-hmm. Yes. It's not, it's not a question of whether we've had these attachment ruptures or traumas because most all of us have that somewhere in our lives, but it's what we've done with it. What have we done to heal and resolve it? That That is the biggest resource that we bring to yes. all of our parent relationships. But parenting is obviously a really important one, and especially one where we have the opportunity to give your children something different that your mom wasn't able to give you, like you talked about, um, which is more security. So- yes. So thank you for for offering more of that perspective. The other thing that I love that this this book does is you talk about the different attachment styles with the use of animals. And <laughs> because you know sometimes the way we describe it in the mental health and psychology world, we can get way too cerebral, it can get confusing. We have sometimes different 
um, researchers or psychologists have used different terms. That's so I love that you have these, you know, animal terms. And so I'd love for you to share about each of the the animals a little bit um, yeah. to give give our listeners a little flavor of that. Love it. So what I want everyone to know is that the attachment research gets really confusing because in for multiple reasons, but one of them is there are two separate bodies of research on attachment. So there's a research body that comes from the developmental psychology tradition. And then there is um, a set of data that comes from the social psychology tradition. And that's why there's so many different names. So in the social psychology, they're focusing only on adult attachment and they call it anxious, avoidant, and um, secure. And they only focus on those three. And then in the developmental psychology, we have names for childhood versions of the attachment style and adult versions of the attachment style. And I mean, I can run through all of them, but so it gets really confusing. People are like, well, I thought I was anxious. And it's like, well, yes. Okay. But the, in this research, we call you ambivalent or resistant in childhood and preoccupied in adulthood. And those are all the same patterns. So I wanted to break it down basically to say, what are these patterns? And I want everyone to know that as we talk about these animals, you might recognize yourself in more than one. And there's a reason for that. We often have more than one attachment figure when we were growing up. So maybe you had two parents or you had a parent and a grandparent or a nanny or um, a teacher. But way, the way we relate to a different caregiver can affect the pattern we develop based on who that caregiver is. Okay, mm -hmm. So if you have a caregiver who's really harsh and dismissive, you're likely to adapt in a, in a particular way. If you have a caregiver who's very warm and responsive, you're going to adapt in a different way. So here are our four patterns. So the first is the koala. And the koala is, is, is synonymous with security. And the koala pattern is basically when I am vulnerable, when I am tender or I feel distress, I do these two things. I reach for my person, whether that person is my partner in adulthood or my parent in childhood, I reach, I cling. So I guess it's three things, reach, cling, and I receive. So mm -hmm. I am soothed in proximity to that person and I actively go for it. I don't sit around and wait for someone to notice that I'm sad or scared. I literally actively find my person and utilize that closeness in order to regulate my body. Mm -hmm. The second is the turtle. So the turtle has learned nobody in my world is effective at responding to me and soothing me. And so when things are tender or distressing, I go inward. I crawl into my shell and I wait for the, the scary, overwhelming emotional material to dissipate before I come back out. And so the turtle's verbs are avoid and distract. Okay. The third animal is the honey badger. And the honey badger. I don't, this is like dating me, but there was this internet meme a long time ago where I'd be like, the honey badger gets what they want. And they'd like just show videos of honey badgers just like going after stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the honey badger is somebody who has had intermittent responses from their caregivers. So sometimes their caregiver is able to be soothing and supportive, and sometimes they aren't. And um, this was my experience growing up. I, I shared that one particular moment, but my mom was sometimes able to be engaged and soothing and supportive, it just depend on her mental health. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of intermittent reinforcement, I don't know when you're going to be there for me and when you're not going to be there for me, creates a type of hypervigilance in somebody. So the honey badger is always looking for more dopamine in their relationships. They're looking for more reassurance and more positive feedback. Do you love me? Do you love me now? Do you still love me? Are you sure you love me? I look like you didn't love me just then. Are you sure you're going to be there for me? Right. So they're, they're scanning, they're being hypervigilant. They're not actually eating the honey. They're just collecting it. So they, their, their verbs are reach and protest. Mm. I reach for you when I'm upset and distressed, but I do not receive your presence as calming or soothing because I don't trust that you will stick around or be there for me at a level that I can mm -hmm. rely on. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth category, I call my baby dragons. And my baby dragons grew up in environments where their attachment figures were actually sources of distress. So they felt frightening in some way. Maybe they had a severe mental illness like schizophrenia or a really um, intensely disorienting drug addiction to methamphetamines or heroin. Um, the parent themselves was a source of danger. And so 
the little baby dragon has to move into a far more disrupted response to that attachment instinct. So when they're tender, their body still wants to seek somebody, but the somebody they have is scary. And so instead of having, you know, in our first three categories, there's there's a patterned way of responding. Our little baby dragons are actually very erratic. We don't always know what they're going to do when they feel tender, but I sort of view it as one of two directions. They either blow up. So that's the fire breathing. They're going to blow up at you when they feel tender, or they're going to shut down, Mm -hmm. dissociate and check out, play freeze, play dead. Mm -hmm. Um, But so those are sort of when we're thinking about how we handle our, our tenderness in our close relationships. Do we reach and receive? Do we reach and protest? Do we avoid and distract? Or do we blow up and shut down? Mm -hmm. That tells us a lot about who our caregivers were or what our other relationships have been like and what we need to process and heal in order to get to a place where we can confidently reach for people and receive what they offer us. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think your book really does a good job of reminding us too that that none of these are bad or right or wrong, you know, that the the turtle, the honey badger, the dragons, those were all things that were needed to adapt yes. and to keep you safe and to figure out how to sort. So it's actually very genius. Nice. Our nervous systems and genius. our nervous systems. Yes. Absolutely. Blowing up and shutting down is a brilliant response to danger. Mm-hmm. Right. And avoiding and distracting is a absolutely effective way to cope when there is nobody who can help you soothe. Yes, absolutely. So yes, 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 yes. Yeah. And, and then we bring these patterns into our adult relationships and our romantic relationships. And so I'm wondering if you can talk more about the ways, and I know you've already shared so vulnerably, so you can share about yourself or if you want to keep it more general, but the ways that those patterns show up and then how, and I know this is a really loaded question, but what are some ways we start to heal that? And, and your book offers a lot of, a lot of journaling prompts and different ideas for healing that as well. So If I grow up in a home where my tender needs are met, what happens internally is a script about myself, about my emotions, about um, the ways in which I can expect other people to value myself and my emotions. And so in an adult context, a secure adult uh, really believes they deserve warmth and care and doesn't... uh, play games around that is really like free. Another one of the extra labels we have is free autonomous. That's another way to describe secure attachment, (laughs) free autonomous. But I think what that really does highlight is that if we had a secure experience, then we go into adulthood, we're not having to work through anything extra, right? I'm just going to openly tell you that I'm sad and I want a hug. I'm going to let you know very clearly I'm exhausted. I could use a little space. And I'm I'm going to anticipate and expect that those are valid needs. When we have had insecure experiences, we come into adulthood and the process of bonding and getting what we need from other adults involves this extra layer of labor. It's this work we have to do. Mm -hmm. Um, For people with that hypervigilant experience, there's a lot of anxiety that comes with bonding with someone because now my nervous system is activated with this kind of old sense that someone's going to leave me or not show up for me. And so it's actually like exhausting to bond to someone because as I bond, there's a little voice in my head that's like, this might not last. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) That just sits there. And so you're working through that all the time. Or if you're avoidant, It's really hard to build intimacy because the minute emotions come in the room, you pop into your shell. And then the people around you are like, do you not care about me? Why do you not want to be with me? And then now there's more material and you're confused. Um, And definitely, definitely, if you've had a disorganized attachment experience, you come into close relationships and close relationships are your Afghanistan. They are your Vietnam, right? Mm -hmm. Like, So now I come in to bond with you and my nervous system says, this is dangerous, mayday, mayday, mayday. And I start picking fights with people because I'm getting close to them. So there's a lot of um, activation that happens in our nervous system from our childhood. 
when we start to bond with people in adulthood. And if that experience in childhood was secure, then the activation in our nervous system is positive. It's like, Mm -hmm. oh, warm, fuzzy. I love you. I love to love you. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But if it was anything like my childhood, then it's far more like, oh, shit. (laughs) You know, I think that's the narrative of all three insecure attachment styles. Oh, shit. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh shit, I have to convince this convince this person to stay and love me. That's the resistant, you know, person or the anxious person, or that's the honey badger. Um, oh shit, there are feelings here. <laughs> <laughs> that's the turtle. Oh shit, I'm in danger. That's the baby dragon. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we all have to kind of work through what's coming up. My husband is a turtle, and the thing I've learned from him most of all is that. The turtling is avoiding burdening other people. It's Mm -hmm. not avoiding connection. It's not avoiding attachment. It's, I don't want to burden you with what I feel. And I learned not to burden my caregivers with what I felt. So as soon as your emotion or my emotion comes into the room, I'm retreating in hopes that that will keep us close. Mm -hmm. Which is very confusing when you're a honey badger because you're like, wait, you're leaving me. Mm-hmm. Why are we leaving the room? Yes. We chased each other around that tree for many years before we finally figured out. And we could pause and go, oh, this is my trauma talking. Mm-hmm. Like you in front of me are a very different person with a much higher capacity for hearing me, seeing me, co-regulating with me. Yes. Ooh. Yes. We're not relating to something necessarily in that present moment. Well, it may feel like it is. It's really the past and those past patterns that, that we've used to keep ourselves safe. Yes. So like, oh, activated again, yep. but not necessarily needed. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think things like your book helps bring more self-awareness into that because what you've just described is not that it's never going to happen. We're still going to have opportunities, mm-hmm. even when we've done all this healing, it's still yeah. possible. Like just when you think you've healed and then it's like something reminds you like, nope, <laughs> yep, yep. a little more work or a new, a, a new work. Work. You've yeah. Done before. Yeah. But just the power of, of self-awareness and the uh, ability to stay more present with what's going on in the present interaction versus just what's responding, you know, rather than responding to the, to the past. Yes. But I can also see where depending on your kind of dominant attachment style and recognizing they change and shift in different contexts with different people where, you know, your book could be like for like an avoidant person. And maybe I'm bringing that up because I have some avoidant tendencies myself too, where it's, you know, I I'm good with the vulnerability part. I think I can, you know, show my vulnerability, show my emotions, but asking for help can sometimes be really challenging for Mm -hmm. me and where I can be, you know, kind of that hyper independent and I can do all the things and I don't need anybody. So even just reading your book, I'm going through and like, these are great questions and I could use these with in my work and with others, but you know, I'm just using this to prepare for this podcast. So I'll come back to it. (laughs) I'll do it it later, which is partially true. I mean, I was using it to prepare, but also I think that avoidant part of me is like, "Mm, yeah, we'll do that later. Yeah. so, So do you have any tips depending on people's attachment styles on how to really embrace a book like this, that's going to invite for some people that might feel scary, more vulnerability reflecting on your past where you might just want to say, I'm fine. Um, And for the honey badgers, you know, they, they might get too preoccupied with all the things that happened in their past. Mm -hmm. Um, So, so share more with us about how we can lean into the book in the most healthy way. Well, I say this in there, but what was broken in relationship is most effectively healed in relationship. So this book is a guide but it is a guide designed to bring you more into connection with the people in your world. And so if you have a a tendency to be avoidant, I would say make a book club, get a few other of your friends that are kind of growth nerds like you are and say, Hey, I could really use some, some community around doing this work. I know I need to, and I can tell I need to, because I opened page 14 and it was like, close (laughs) that. (laughs) So can we do this together? Because Mm -hmm. it will help 
kind of reduce the shame and the terror around some of that processing and being like, oh, you have some stuff too. I wasn't a, you know, there wasn't something wrong with me as a kid. This was just something that I went through and you went through it too. And, um, but having that co-regulation and community, uh, also just doing it with a therapist. It's a great idea. Like, can we just go through this book together? Um, you know, there are a lot of therapists that are really kind and loving people who, um, don't always know all the right questions to ask around attachment. Um, and so that's another thought I had when I wrote this book was like, I want this book to be, you know, if you found a therapist and you're like, I like them, but like, I need a little more from them. You can be like, Hey, here we go. Let's Mm -hmm. work through this together. And then having them there is so valuable because you have someone who's processing with you, bearing witness with you, who can Mm -hmm. help regulate your body, who can help you notice and recognize, Hey, wow. Did you notice how, you know, we skipped over this part really fast, but you said these things and that seems really important. Let's slow down and sit together. And then, you know, they're inviting you into that and you can kind of be like, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think we have so many therapists that that listen to this podcast. I think it's so important to also use it on yourself first. Yeah, it's that, always. that parallel, not and I know I've got more work to to go in here and 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 really be in it. But yes, and that I could use this with some trusted other people or with my own therapist. So yeah. then when you're using it with somebody else, again, you, then you're staying present and not like back there, you know, visiting your, your own childhood memories and things. So love that. So I, love, I love that advice. Um, the other thing that you do for people who aren't sure, am I a koala or turtle, honey badger, dragon, you have, you know, some questions in here that can guide them through really figuring out their styles is there more you want to say about that? Because I know you, we've already touched on how styles can shift and mm-hmm. yeah, just more, more that you can share around learning about our own styles. Yeah. Well, I think I really like to remind all of us that attachment is in the developmental research. Attachment is a study of a dynamic. So I, uh, I mean, I had a turtle response to my dad growing up. Um, And I had a honey badger response to my mom. And so in different relationships that I've had over the years, depending on who that person was, like what their capacity was, I've had, I've come into those different patterns. Mm -hmm. Um, I never experienced a frightening caregiver. So I don't really have that experience of of the disorganized piece of insecurity, but I do absolutely know what it feels like to want to turtle my tenderness inside. And I do know what it feels like to want to constantly monitor someone else's emotional state as a form of representing my belonging in the world or my okayness in relationship to them. Mm -hmm. So as you're reading through it, you know, I think um, you're really looking at, well, what happened when I was growing up and what happened between me and these other people? And then how has that impacted what's happening between me and other people in my grown up life? Um, and, and knowing that you may, you know, process one relationship and think, oh, wow, actually, that was really pretty secure and mm-hmm. process another relationship and go, oh, that wasn't or, or that person was relating to me really securely, and I wasn't able to receive it. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's, it's very nuanced, I, I guess. It's kind of fun to do the like Harry Potter quiz, you know, where you're like, which Harry Potter character? Are you? <laughs> but I think it's it's really complex and nuanced um, and that the real key in this work is reflection in in contrast to security. So I'm always reflecting on, is this a secure response or not? So, and that's part of why I called the book Securely Attached. There are books on like attachment theory and like, you know, stuff. And I thought, no, it, this is really about helping people move from insecure to secure. That's what we all want. Mm-hmm. So I think really, as you're reading through the text, I do a lot of like secure tips. And then the whole third section is learning secure patterns in relationship. I guess one more caveat is that my editor made me put romantic into the into the subtitle. <laughs> I was like, can it just say relationships? And like, it's confusing. And I was like, I know, but it's not just for romance. This mm-hmm. is for whoever it is you bond with as your person. And I know a lot of people that their primary attachment figure is not their romantic partner. It's mm-hmm. their BFF. Mm-hmm. So it's who do you go to in those moments of tenderness and distress? Um, and that 
whether you're single or you're partnered or you're partnered, but your partner isn't your person, like it doesn't matter. Like this book is about understanding how you relate to your close people and helping you identify who you want to be your close people. As you go through this, it'll help you sift out some of the dynamics where people maybe just aren't going to be able to offer you the type of security that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Yes. I love the broad application of thinking about it more universally. All relationships offer. All close relationships. Yes. Yes. So like I said, we have a lot of therapists who are going to be tuning in also parents, teachers, and if they can think more about how to utilize this in their own first in their own lives, starting with them, but then also how can they use this more in their work? I know they can take stuff directly out of the book, but other tips, advice, things that kind of make this like, I see the needle yeah. move. Yeah. <laughs> so I have an um, acronym that I like to use when I'm talking about that crucible moment in a relationship where one person is deep in their feelings and needing support. Um, And you can use this with your partner, with your students, with your clients, with your kids, whoever. But I call it calm. And it's sort of in my brain how the process of secure co-regulation works. So the C is for contain. So the first thing that we need to offer someone in emotional dysregulation is a sense that we are contained, that we are safe, that we are going to keep them safe, and that we are going to hold their emotions with them. The kind of underlying sentiment is, I got you. I got you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, containing a two-year-old might be like taking the metal truck out of their hand as they try and like whack you in the head with it. Um, It might be with a 17-year-old that you just don't say a single word. You just really let your body posture get relaxed and receptive, but that we're sending the message. I can tell you are dysregulated and overwhelmed, and I'm going to be here to help you calmly and supportively. So that's C. A is attune. Attunement is about being able to accurately catch the internal or emotional state in somebody else. Mm -hmm. I like to say, you want to take a little sip of the feeling, not a chug, and certainly don't pop it on the top of your head. Right? You don't have to become the feeling. Nope. Don't take it on. Mm -hmm. Take it in just Mm -hmm. enough. Take a Mm -hmm. tip because we want the other person to feel felt. Mm -hmm. We want them to be able to sense that we are with them in this feeling state, but that we are still at the sea. I am still calm. I am still contained. I am still containing you. Mm -hmm. And I can feel you. Oh, you know, we let our facial expression change. We let our body a uh, posture shift into a space that really shows I'm not here to control you. I'm here to receive you. We let our nervous system open up in such a way that the person can feel that we're feeling them. Okay? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then those are the first two most magical pieces. That part is usually the part that takes the longest in this process of co-regulating. Depends on the person, how upset they are, what's happening, but we're really going to stay there. I got you. I feel you. I got you. I feel you. I got as long as we need to for that person's nervous system to borrow our calmness and our warmth. Mm -hmm. Once they've received that, then their body tends to get to a place where they start to be more verbal and more rational. And they're going to tell us a little more about what's happening with words. I mean, if you have a six month old, they don't have words yet. Um, So you're just doing CNA. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I got you. I feel you. I got you. I feel you. But now it's, I hear you. So now we're, we're going to listen. That's what the L is for. So we've contained, we've attuned, and now we're listening. And, and I hear you is, is different than I feel you. It's different than I got you. It's I'm really listening to you. Mm-hmm. And then when that person feels really heard by us, there's usually this shuddery breath that comes out that's like, or a mm-hmm. settling of their nervous system. They've gotten a good dose of GABA. <laughs> and when that's happened, we melt. Mm-hmm. And that melting looks different in every close relationship. That melting might be hugging. It might be leaning head to head. It might be they lean on your lap and you play with their hair. It might just be that they go, 
thank you. When you say thank you for sharing with me, thank you for letting me in, thank you for letting me care for you. Um, but that's what we're doing in therapy. That's what we're doing in parenting. That's what we're doing in partnering. And if you do that well, if you can master this, which to everyone listening, and I, I made it sound simple, I want to acknowledge <laughs> this takes a lot of work, which is why I did the workbook. This is mm-hmm. the piece, you mm-hmm. know, like can you do this is usually related to has it been done for you or have you processed and grieved the fact that it hasn't mm-hmm. um, and, and done that grieving in the presence of people who then can offer you a little bit of what that feels like. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I would say get that marked in your head, calm, contain, attune, listen, melt, contain, attune, listen, melt. Yes. We love acronyms. And- <laughs> In mental health and parenting, all of it. So that's a great one to keep. And and the the way that you preface that with this, that doesn't make it easy either, because it requires a lot of our own nervous system and regulation. And so I think it's also okay to say when you can't be that calm for yes. others to mm-hmm. be able to say, I you know, I need to take my own regulation break or whatever it is, because that's also modeling that we can't do this a hundred percent of the time. And the attachment research says that we don't need to do this a hundred percent of the time. Right. Oh no, you, you can't, nobody can. Mm -hmm. Um, And also luckily the people in our lives, hopefully aren't dysregulated a hundred percent of the time and needing this a hundred percent of the time. Mm -hmm. Um, This last week I had a dysregulated day. I knew that before I could go into a space of any of that type of connection and co-regulation, I needed to be alone first. I could feel it. It's like, I need mm-hmm. alone time. I need to just be by myself. And, and when I was by myself, I could feel kind of the, the little gremlins going around, right? The kind of blame shame gremlins are like, well, he should have this and that. And oh, how could he expect blah, 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 blah. That mm-hmm. defensiveness was in my body, but I, you know, I'm old enough and weird enough and I've been doing this work for long enough to know let, just let give some more time, give some more time, wait till your body comes down. And then I could enter the kitchen and go, Hey, and he could go, Hey, and I could be like, I'm tired. He's like, I know me too. Like, you know, and then there's this kind of resetting together that we could do. Um, but I've done that with my kids too. I've, I've had moments with all my kids during toddlerhood where they were like, you know, not assaulting me, but you know, I don't know, like <laughs> that level. Right. And, and I've had to be like, I'm literally, I love you. I, I I need, mama needs to go and like running to another room, shutting a door. <laughs> you know, my kids are like banging on the other side of the door and I'm there with my back against the door going, I am the parent. I can handle this. It will be okay. Mm-hmm. And then opening the door and then letting them run into my arms and figuring out how to co-regulate. Mm-hmm. Um, so I love that message too, of like, we aren't always at capacity where we can give this and we can offer this. So yes. to take a break. And the other thing that makes me think of is repair, which is something else that we we need for secure attachment because we don't get it right all the time. We're not at capacity all of the time. But what is sometimes missing in our childhood stories and in our adult stories is that person that can lean in with us and say, you know, that that was a rupture and maybe they're not using that attachment language, but that was, that was a mess up and to have some accountability and to say, you know, how do we move forward? I'm sorry. I want to hear you. And that is a part, another additional capacity. I think that we don't probably talk enough about that is again, another one of those things that can be really challenging. Because we may not have had that model. Well, I think repair is really interesting because for a lot of people, um, accountability was confused with um, like a shame-based model that says, Mm -hmm. you have to say, I'm bad. I was the bad one. Or I lost. You win. Like Mm -hmm. a dominance-based version of relating versus repair is about, I miss you. Let's come back together. Let's find each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, Repair is not, I own everything about what just went down with us and it's mm-hmm. my fault or you own everything or, you know, it's it's far more, that was messy. I'm sorry. I don't want to disconnect with you. I'm going to melt my nervous system into a receptive state 
And I'm going to hope that you are able to do the same so that we can get back into that kind of melty place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So, and you give so many examples of this too on, on your social media. So as much as I want to stay with this book, I also want to hear about the fact that you're already writing a second book and didn't, uh, just for everyone to understand, didn't this book just drop like <laughs> this month <laughs> or last month? I mean, I mean, let, let's, for my family's sake, let me announce that I will not be writing another book for at least a year after this second book comes out. <laughs> okay. Writing and then doing and producing and selling. I mean, it's crazy. Um, so the, this first book came out, I finished writing it a little while ago, but it takes a while for books to come out. Um, during my process of writing my second book. So my second book is actually, um, I've finished writing it. So now it's just editing and it will be out in the fall, but it is the parenting addendum to this. And it's not a workbook like my first book. Um, okay. It is a bookie book. So mm -hmm. the, the title tentatively is going to be Raising Securely Attached Kids. And it is really what do we actually do to cultivate a secure relationship with our kids? Because there are so many parenting books with brilliant advice, trips, tips, hacks, all the things. Mm -hmm. But those things don't work with, with enough regularity if we don't know how to create that secure attachment foundation. Mm -hmm. And I find that a lot of people don't know how to do that part. So they're like, well, I tried the gentle voice and they didn't whatever, it's like, oh, well, actually what we're dealing with here is some reflective functioning issues. <laughs> I mean, this is, well, that's a little on the nerdy end. The book isn't, isn't, is way more accessible, but it's like, how, how do we learn uh, the sense of trust in our caregivers and how can we be the type of caregiver our children can trust? Mm -hmm. um, so that's the second book, 10 chapters on that. Mm, <laughs> I can't wait. You'll have to come back so we can nerd out some more and talk oh, about yes. the second book. Um, well, what else can you share with us? I've already plugged your social media because clearly I'm a fan. But what <laughs> else can you share? So, so obviously the book, you know, I know it's available everywhere. You can buy a book, Amazon yeah. and all those places. But your your website's also a great tool. You've got some freebies. But any other resources or things you want our listeners to know about? Yeah. Um, so attachmentnerd.com is my website where I do all my extra kind of longer form courses. So if you're looking for a class on how to be a secure partner in the midst of parenting, I have like a two hour class on that, or, um, how do I, um, deal with my highly sensitive child? I have like a class on that. So there's a bunch of like more long form information and a village. So there's a place where you can come in and join honesty hours, which is what we call our, we decided to call that instead of happy hour. Like parents don't really need happy hours. We're like, <laughs> we're in a place to be honest. So like mm -hmm. honesty hours and, um, there's a book club there where you can work through the secure attachment book with other people. So if you don't have people in your life, there's a place there where you can come in and ask questions and share and do that stuff like that. Um, and then attachmentlabs.com, um, is, uh, a, a business that I've created with my long-term clinical partner, Janelle Alfin. And what we have there are, um, coaches and therapists who are attachment specific available to do short-term kind of coaching work that is connection focused. So if you're having trouble with your child or your partner or yourself, and you're like, I could really use some help and some guidance around this. You can connect to one of our coaches there. Um, we are in the long term going to do some clinical trainings on there. I just need more free time. But in the long <laughs> term, that will be coming up for, for clinicians. So you can just kind of keep your eye on that. And yeah, I just I'm so thankful to do this work. I, I know you feel the same way. Like it's such an honor to be a part of something that you know has an actual impact on the world in the long term. Like. Mm -hmm. I just can't wait to be, I'll be like, you know, hopefully, I don't know, 97. I'll have all my kids there at my deathbed and they'll be going, <laughs> Ma, it's okay. You can die. And I'll be going, <laughs> what are the statistics though? Are they better? And they're like, yes, way more secure attachment in the world. The, the numbers have changed. And I'll be like, okay. Yes. All okay. I love you. Goodbye. Right. Absolutely. Well, you're doing that. And and by sharing your own journey as well, you're, you're helping so many people, which makes me 
you know, I didn't get to ask you about maybe another case that you've seen this come to life because you talk so much about yourself, but can you maybe just briefly share as we start to wrap up a case where you have seen where the parent or caregiver has done their own work towards moving towards increased security and how that has changed that parenting dynamic dynamic. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking in particular of a mother who, when her children were young, her partner had a pretty serious bipolar episode, an extended manic episode um, that was both disorienting and scary and exhausting for her. And in that period of time, she developed a really significant drinking problem in response to that. It was kind of like, I don't know how to cope. And with her firstborn child, I think did a bit of just sort of like, I can't deal with you. Mm-hmm. So like, some cry it out that she didn't love doing, which that's a whole other longer topic. I think there's a time and a place for helping children learn to sleep. I think it's also complex and the data is not clear, (laughs) but I I think for her, she looks back on it and was like, my kid really need me. And I was really not responding. I was Mm -hmm. like shutting the door, not listening to the monitor drinking. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when the child was like six, seven years old, Like there was some obvious insecurity in that relationship going on. Mom could feel the child was struggling, but like couldn't soothe her. And so we did some work together where the mom in in appropriate terms basically said to her child, I'm so sorry, but when you were little, I was really not okay. Mm -hmm. And I left you in your room crying a lot. And I didn't go get you because I didn't know what to do. And And this person, Dr. Ferber, told me to do this. And I thought I'd do that. Um, Mm -hmm. And I had this really just sweet like um, experience watching these two process. And it was really interesting watching the child because she doesn't have, you know, cognizant memories of those experiences, but she could feel them in her body. Mm -hmm. It was creating sort of an anxious preoccupation with her mom. And I watched this kid just go, like, it was so relieving. It was like, it made sense somehow to her. Mm -hmm. And she said, it's okay, mom, but someone should talk to this Dr. Ferber. (laughs) Which is like, (laughs) Uh, but they learned to melt together. And there was like a new trust. It was like the child could sense that mom had really understood her feeling states. She couldn't remember them uh, in in a storytelling way, but she definitely remembered them in an implicit kind of way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and it really helped mom too to sort of become less avoidant, just kind of acknowledging it. It's like now we're working forward in this story of I'm sharing what I'm feeling. You're sharing what you're feeling. It's okay to have feelings. We'll deal with them together. Um, there's just really no point that it's too late. Like, I, I think I've worked with people who are estranged from their parents and they just long for their parents to say, I'm so sorry. I did those things. Mm-hmm. It's amazing how powerful. That yes, is. absolutely. Just saying, you know, and I plan on doing that with my kids. I, mm-hmm. I don't know exactly what it will be. I mean, there was a hard time for me during the pandemic. Um, I had twins right at the height of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my son went from being an only child to having twin sisters to not having school to like, Oh, my babies weren't chill. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, so there was some time in there that he and I have had to do some repair around for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I plan on being the type of parent in the long run that says like, oh yeah, I hear you. That makes sense. That was hard. I'm sure there'll be a weird thing for my kids around like becoming somewhat notorious in the world. That's a weird thing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Like spotted at airports when I'm traveling with my kids and they're like, dealing with someone being like, are you the attachment nerd? And like, (laughs) well, there's something weird about that. Like, sure. And then like, right. Like what legacy does that put on them of like, I'm, I'm, well, I'm supposed to be this well-behaved regulated kid all the time Mm because my mom's this attachment nerd. And yeah, I'm sure there's a lot, a lot you'll continue to work through that, but it's worth it because I think you're also modeling the messiness that comes with that, you know, yeah, they're going to be messy parents too. Right. Like, I mean, I guess if they chose, if they choose parenthood, but like, there's no, there's no not messy human. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. not a thing, but there are human beings who can own their messiness and who can return to connection and who can choose the path of openness to the feelings of others. Mm-hmm. And- yes. Another thing. And then we're going to end as much as I don't want to, <laughs> but in the book, 
it struck me where you talked about hope and there's so much hope embedded in this conversation today that we've had. Like it's never too late there. We're always doing this work. We're always growing. And hope can also be like a double-edged sword sometimes because it can be very vulnerable. Your exact words are hope is a real booger, um, <laughs> but it's, uh, but it's also a heaviness that you say is worth holding. And so as we end on a lot of hope, I want you to also just share with us what, what you mean about, you know, taking a risk with hope. Mm -hmm. When we allow ourselves to feel desire, that longing for being seen, being heard, being adored, being connected, being wanted. Um, we are putting ourselves in a position where we will at some point experience loss. So all hope is connected to loss. Mm -hmm. Isn't that depressing? But it's true, right? So if I hope for, um, you know, a, a deep love with my husband, which I, I've got and I had to hope for it, but it was scary. I am aware as a human being that one or, or both of us at some point is going to pass on from this world or make a choice that makes the relationship untenable or something like that. Like that is a part of the fabric. And that's true when you become a parent. I mean, that's why a lot of people struggle with intrusive thoughts as parents is that there's a deep awareness that like my child could get hurt. Mm -hmm. I could get hurt. Something could happen here. This is not like, you know, security is not ultimate safety without the possibility of pain. Mm -hmm. Security is, I am going to trust my body and my desires, and I'm going to move towards warmth and goodness, and I'm going to, I'm going to let myself receive it when it exists in my world. And oh, I'm going to have to grapple with the truth that very little in life is permanent. Mm -hmm. And so what I say when in that section around hope is a booger, part of what I'm, I'm wanting people to understand is that just because you feel nervous about it doesn't mean it's not a good secure choice. Mm -hmm. Keep reaching, keep looking. Does it look warm and responsive and caring and mature? Reach. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Are you going to be scared? Yes. It doesn't stop being scary. It really doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, the hope is that it stops being um, scary to reach for those people. <laughs> yes. Yes. And sometimes in healing, we might be afraid that we're getting, you know, worse before we get better because we're also opening ourselves up to feel more, but we can do that in a way where hopefully we're, we do that alongside of security or with security so yeah. that I'm feeling more and that a lot of my attachment system and old stories might be saying, this is scary mm -hmm. and I'm still going to stay with it. And I'm going to reach out now instead of shutting down yes. or whatever those, those old strategies are. So I think that message of hope to be cautiously optimistic is, yes. is so important. Yes. Yes. Love that. Love so, is there anything else you want to send us off with? I often ask, like, what do you envision for our future, especially in regards to attachment? And you've spoke a lot to that already, but anything else you want to say? Well, one of my favorite things to say to everybody who's in this conversation is that there is no such thing as a human being who is not worthy of deep, secure connection. Mm -hmm. If that is something you're worried about, if you're worried that you're not something enough or you're too much that's just your attachment wound that's mm -hmm. all that is mm -hmm. everyone deserves close proximity to other people and if you haven't found your people yet it doesn't mean there's something wrong with you or that your people aren't there it just means you haven't found your people yet mm -hmm. hang in there they're out there yes amen to that and we will be sure to link your website and the, and the resources you mentioned, your book also lists some more resources at the end. And you have this beautiful closing love letter at the end, and I'm not going to give it all away. I don't want too many spoiler alerts, but I, <laughs> okay. think it, I think it really marries to what you just said, which I love these last two lines. May you know the healing of separating the past from the present. May you know many, many secure connections where you experience true belonging and joy. So it made me cry. <laughs> oh, 
Hopefully I meant it. <laughs> yes. So journey, journey on. They're so beautiful. And I can't wait to nerd out with you some more. Yes, Eli, we talk too. again when the new book comes out. Thank you Fantastic. so much for spending this hour with me. I know that our listeners and viewers are love it too. So take care. Thank you. You too. Bye. 